Today we're going to have a look at a look at contracts. It's a very crucial topic, not just from the purposes of CLAT and various other entrance examinations, but contracts is a topic which if you know something about, it's always going to stand you in good stead for the rest of your life. Contracts, especially the Indian Contract Act of 1872, it's perhaps the most fundamental law which any person should be aware of for the rest of your life. It's the basic fundamental law which defines companies, commercial transactions, so whether or not you become a lawyer, if you have some basic understanding about contracts and contract law, it will always do you well. So when we hear the word contract, typically we think that it's synonymous with another word called agreement. Contracts and agreements are quite similar, but there are some broad distinctions between the two. We say that all contracts are agreements, but all agreements are not contracts. So only certain agreements are contracts. In fact, for a very simplistic definition of a contract, just three words. Agreement, or rather four words. It's an agreement enforceable by law. So what do we mean when I say something is enforceable and that too by law? Enforceable by law essentially means that if one of the parties to this particular contract does not do what he or she was supposed to do, then the other party can sue the person and seek enforcement of the contract in either of two ways, either making the, the court pass an order, directing the person who is in breach of contract to do what he's supposed to do. Or in the alternative, some compensation must be paid by the person who has breached the contract and to the person who is suffering some loss as a consequence of that breach. So again, just to quickly recap, a contract is nothing but an agreement which is enforceable by law. So all agreements are not contracts, but all contracts are agreements. In order for an agreement to be a contract, there are certain tests, certain requirements, certain conditions which must be satisfied. Where do we find these tests? We find these tests laid down and specified in the law dealing with contracts in India called the Indian Contract Act of 1872. So in short I write ICA, Indian Contract Act, 1872. Note the year, 1872. It's like a prehistoric law. It's been around for almost 160 years. Framed when India was still under British rule. But still in vogue, still very much in play and very, very important. It's undergone a few changes from time to time, as in by way of amendments. But the core of contract law, what it was way back in 1872, still remains the same today. So as I was telling you, these tests, these requirements, these conditions which have to be satisfied in order for an agreement to be a contract can be found in the Indian Contract Act of 1872. What these requirements are, we'll have a look at another day. But for now, let us go into understanding how exactly does a contract come into existence between two parties. There are typically two stages in the formation of a contract. What we call an offer followed by an acceptance. So one person makes another offer or a proposal to another party and once that offer is accepted by the other party, acceptance, then and there comes into existence a contract. So offer plus acceptance, mathematics, is equal to a contract. Do keep in mind that this offer plus acceptance must be known to both the parties vice versa in order for it to be a valid offer or a valid acceptance as the case might be. Once there is a valid offer, so thus we see that an offer followed by an acceptance ultimately culminates in the conclusion of a contract, which basically means now there are legally binding obligations on the two parties to a contract. So let's say A and B entered into a contract, A made an offer to B and B accepted this offer. 
Now there arises legally binding obligations on both of them. A must do what he had said he would do and likewise B must do what he had promised he would do. A contract is nothing but a give and take situation. I do something for you and in return you do something for me. It's like an exchange. It's like a barter. It's like a reciprocal arrangement. Something flows from me to you and likewise something flows back from you to me. If either of us don't do what we have said we will do, then the other party can sue for enforcement of the contract. Take another situation for example. Sometimes prior to the offer stage, you have something called an invitation to offer. There's a difference between me saying, I want to sell my watch to you. Will you buy it from me for rupees 5,000? That's an offer. But if I ask 50 of you sitting in front of me, who wants to buy my watch and for how much? Then I'm not making an offer per se. But what I'm doing in the process is I'm inviting each and every single one of you to make offers to me. Once I've received 50 such offers, I may then decide whether I want to accept any of them or not. If I do accept any offer, then it leads to the formation of a contract. In between, we may negotiate, we may bargain a bit. I said, will you buy this from me for a piece 50,000? You say, no, Rishak, 50,000 is too expensive for this watch. I'll pay you 20,000. So now the ball is back in my court. You've made an offer to me now. And because your offer is in response to my offer, we call it a counter offer. So we can keep going on back and forth. You say 20,000, I say 30,000, then you say 24,000, I say 26,000. And ultimately, let's say either of us accepts the other's offer or counter offer as the case might be at 25,000. That's the point of time when the contract comes into existence. Thereafter, you have to do what you had said you will do. I will have to do what I had said I would do. As we all know, a contract is nothing but an agreement enforceable by law. Just to recap, if we go back to our school days and use our set theory perspective and Venn diagrams, if the universal set is an agreement, contracts is nothing but a subset. So all contracts are agreements, but all agreements are not contracts. So as we had mentioned earlier, in order for an agreement to be a contract, there are certain tests or conditions which must be satisfied, which are specified in the Indian Contract Act of 1872. Today, we're going to have a look at what some of these tests or some of these requirements are. The very first requirement in order for an agreement to be a contract requires that both the parties, or as many parties as there might be to an agreement or a contract, they must be competent or eligible to be in, enter into a contract. So we're going to look at competency of parties. Do keep in mind that anybody and everybody cannot enter into a contract. In order for you to be entitled, to be qualified to enter into a contract, there are certain requirements. First and foremost, you must be an adult. You must be 18 years of age. What does it mean therefore? That a minor, a child, cannot enter into a contract by himself or herself. A minor may enter into a contract if he or she is represented by a parent or a guardian, but alone standing on his own foot, he or she cannot enter into a contract. So first requirement, you have to be an adult. Second requirement, you must be of sound mind in order to enter into a contract. Insane people, mad people, they can't enter into contracts. Thirdly and lastly, you must not be barred by any law from entering into a contract.
So the first thing, in order for an agreement to be a contract, you must determine whether the parties are competent to enter into a contract. To recap, you must be an adult of sound mind and must not be embarred by any law. The second requirement, in order for an agreement to be a contract, is that this particular contract or agreement which we are talking about must have a legal object. What is a legal object or what is an object firstly? An object is the purpose of the contract, the purpose of the agreement. Why have two people or more entered into this particular agreement or contract with each other? What is the reason? What is the objective? What is the purpose? So let's say you and I enter into an agreement where I say I'm going to sell my laptop to you for 20,000 rupees and you say yes, fine, I'll buy your laptop for 20,000 rupees. So my object is to sell the laptop to you and get money from you. Your object is to get the laptop by giving me some money. This object therefore is the buying and selling of a laptop. Is it a legal object? Yes, there's nothing illegal, nothing wrong about buying or selling a laptop. So very well, this test is satisfied. Therefore, this agreement could qualify as a contract subject to the other tests and conditions being satisfied. Let's take another example. Let's take an example where it's an illegal object and which therefore won't be a contract. Let's say I agree to sell some drugs to you for 5,000 rupees and you agree to pay me 5,000 rupees for that drugs. What's the object? Buying and selling of drugs. We all know that in India and a lot of other places for that matter, buying and selling of drugs is illegal. So although here there is an agreement between the two of us, that is you and I have agreed that I will give you some drugs, you and I have agreed that you will give me some money in exchange, the object being illegal, it will just be an agreement, it will not be a contract. So it'll come under this part, it won't be a contract, which therefore means it won't be enforceable by law. So if, I give, if you give me the money and thereafter I don't give you the drugs, you can't go to court and file a case against me. Why? Because it's not enforceable by law. That's the reason. Today I'm going to look at the topic of special contracts. These are contracts, it's just they have some particular features which are unique to them, which is why we call them special contracts. So there are various special types, special contracts. We have contracts of partnership, which come under special contracts. We have contracts of bailment. We have contracts of principal agency, agency contracts. So all these are various types of special contracts. The first one which I'm going to look at today is what we call the contract of bailment. Do keep in mind that this has nothing to do with bail as we contemplate under criminal law. Criminal law bail is completely separate from bailment in terms of contract law. Bailment is something which is very simple and straightforward. Let's take a quick example. A gives something to B for a particular purpose, for a particular reason. Once that purpose is satisfied, B returns whatever was given by A to A. This we call a bailment. A is called the bailer and B is called the bailey. And the relationship between them or the contract between them is called a bailment. To give you a very simple example from a real life situation, let's say my car stops working, let's say I'm A. I give my car to a mechanic or to a garage to get it fixed. Once the mechanic, the garage fixes it, he returns my car to me and I pay him whatever his charges are. So that's a bailment. While my car is with the mechanic, while the goods have been bailed by the bailer to the bailey, the bailey is expected to take as much care of the goods as a reasonable or a prudent person would take care of those goods as if they were his own goods. So in other words, the bailer is trusting the bailey or entrusting the bailey with his goods so that he gets it back in the same shape, if not in a better shape, after whatever it is that the bailey was required to do with the goods. 
in the event that something goes wrong, the goods get damaged while they're in the possession of the bailey, then the bailey is expected to compensate the bailer for the loss that might ensue. Another thing which is very important so far as a bailer bailey relationship is concerned, it's like any other contract. If the bailer gives any instruction to the bailey, the bailey is under an obligation to comply with such instruction. If such instruction or obligation is not complied with, it would tantamount to breach of contract for which the bailer may sue the bailey for enforcement in the form of specific performance of the contract or for compensation. So that's so far as bailment is concerned, just an example of a special contract. Let's have another quick look at another type of special contract, agency contracts. Agency contracts are pretty straightforward. A asks B to do something on his behalf. A could have done it himself, but A chooses to get somebody else to do it for his behalf. A is therefore called the principal and B is called the agent. A classic example of a principal agent relationship would be a travel agent. I want to travel from Calcutta to Bombay. Instead of booking a ticket on a flight by myself, I ask my travel agent to do it on my behalf. So I become the principal, the travel agent becomes my agent, the two of us have, a, the two of us have entered into a contract where he's supposed to do something on my behalf and in return I give him his agency fee, some commission or some extra charges. Let's say the ticket costs 7,000 rupees, my agent might charge me 7,200, so that 200 rupees is what he gets for having given me his services.